Hey, welcome back. This is How We Innovate. This is part two of a series with Gary Labaza. Uh, so we were, we just heard a great overview about the ways he led uh, engineering and business teams at uh, his company and how they won some pretty uh, fantastic market share uh, with a really innovative product. So um, Sruthi, I know you have some questions. You want to jump in first and, and we'll, we'll pick Gary's brain a little bit on some of the finer details here. Hi Gary, I think the uh, innovation through time uh, was the best uh, message delivered uh, and uh, we feel that uh, it has given a very good insight into how we should uh, innovate and execute in our uh, future ventures and um, I just have a quick question like uh, so when it comes to agriculture or like in general, uh, uh, the industry you are looking at, what do you think would be the biggest challenge for any uh, person? Yeah, well, uh, right now, I mean, it depends on your consumer. Um, and I would say that uh, the residential consumer space in the current um, era is really um, um, experiencing a lot of new technology in battery driven products and so it's and it's an interesting parallel to automotive right automotive uh, is doing if you see all the television commercials you know all the automotive things are pitching um, battery driven products mm -hmm. but they still sell a lot of gas and it's a challenge when you're in you have an installed gas driven business um, that you you react to the change in technology and provide that to a consumer. And the consumer, while they know a lot about gas, especially if they've been in the industry, they know what to rely on if they go out and mow their lawn. Um, they don't know much about a battery offering, yet they're proliferating like crazy. So you have to convince uh, a consumer that the product will do the job that they want done. Um, so I think the industry is facing that challenge right now. And then a commercial cutter, they, they make their living based on that. So they're a little even more skeptical and they consume a lot more power. So their consumption of the power driving the, the, the lawnmower is eight hours a day, whereas a consumer will do it you know one hour a week or maybe two hours. So the, the demand is not as high and I think that's that, the, that the, it's always the evolution of technology that manufacturers and you know branded companies need to keep pace with to be competitive uh, and convince the consumer that they, they, they're offering a product that gets a job done. So hopefully that answers your question. But yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting time, right? Uh, because the, the uh, battery-driven uh, solutions that can be thought of differently than maybe a grass driven lawnmower. There are different ways to to make them work. So it's it's an exciting time yet an, a nerve wracking time at the same same point. Great, great question. Yeah. Sophia? Um, yeah, hi Gary. Thank you for the presentation. It was really cool. Um, I have a few specific questions. My first one is you said that the primary market was initially the riding residential um, mowers mm -hmm. and then you guys were the first to come up with the zero turn mower mm -hmm. um, what did how did the process look like when you found out that people needed a zero turn mower like was that a personal experience or was it people coming and telling you or did you go out and ask people um, how did you figure out that they needed that yeah that that's a very insightful question because um, I'm not sure that it's a little bit like you know a, an iP iPod you guys know what an mm -hmm. iPod yeah, is? Yeah. No one ever asked for an iPod, right. but uh, we're glad Apple came out with it and uh -huh. then the iPhone to follow. Um, I think it was more of just knowing the marketplace and the fact that people, even though they were residential, you know, they weren't doing it for work, everybody, we knew the marketplace was getting more and more starved for time. Mm -hmm. They wanted to spend less time doing chores and things in the yard, but they, they wanted the yard, right? They, right. they didn't want to abandon that nice space to enjoy with their family. Um, and you, we could just sense 
that with the kind of evolution of two income households and but you know still doing everything right involved in sports involved in you know work involved in taking care of the basics of life um, that there was just the sentiment that come out came out of our research that that was an emerging trend mm -hmm. and so we were we were the first to come up with a residential zero turn mm -hmm. and not the commercial mm -hmm. side so just to be clear I don't want people to think that I'm <laughs> claiming that we did something we didn't do um, and it was more just by studying the space and I talked a little bit before about taking external opportunity and marrying it with internal capability mm -hmm. we were a scale business we did things in a lot of volume mm -hmm. so we knew how to take a very um, technical durable product and find the things to scale back on to make it affordable to a consumer mm -hmm. so it was a combination of that uh, kind of studying consumer trends mm -hmm. and then trying some stuff we were a privately held company so they were entrepreneurial in nature and they like to try stuff and yeah like you know it was like we can do that you know it's like I hope we can do that you know uh, and uh, so it was more about just a combination of knowing external opportunity and internal capability and it really was just you know it's hard to imagine I'm sure you folks are like I'm busy all the time I got all things going on but you know when when that emergence probably more in the 80s and 90s you know of two income housing houses and just people working eight or ten hours a day and then mm -hmm. having to take care of stuff you know the, the, the time saving on a zero turn is significant mm. so yeah. yeah thank you Safira you said you had a uh, few questions if yeah you want me to keep going yeah keep going um, sure <laughs> let me have it um, my next question was you said that um, all these other competitors entered the market after you guys had created the zero turn, the residential one. Um, and I just had a question about whether you guys had patented it at all. I don't know a lot about patents necessarily, but I know patents are a bit more applicable in actual yeah. products like that. So patenting that technology, is that something you guys did? or? There are certain things we can patent. Like I showed you a... Uh, a zero turn with a steering wheel mm -hmm. and we own we own the patent mm -hmm. on that I'm not sure if it wasn't uh, patentable or we didn't patent it I'm not I'm not really sure but mm -hmm. I would suggest that because the it was done in the commercial space that there were probably prior prior patents and prior I, I, IP on that uh, we were able to apply it in in the uh, consumer space but it was already in the market in a different market segment uh -huh. so it was difficult to patent it would be my guess although I wasn't as deep into product development as I am now but uh, it would be my guess but that's a great question because there are things like it's called synchro steer technology if you look at that that platform what ends up happening is it's it's controlled by these sticks I call them but there are other term for them I forget but you basically pull back on one and it stops this wheel from turning mm -hmm. and you accelerate on this one and it just turns the unit because this one's moving mm -hmm. and that one's not. So we figure out how to do that with the steering wheel because oh, okay. a lot more people are comfortable doing that. And there's this cuckoo clock gear system underneath <laughs> that has all these oblong gears. It's really cool. And we do have patented technology on that, which we've successfully defended against some of our competitors. Okay. Yeah. That's a great question. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Interesting story. So these two students are representative of literally hundreds if not thousands of student entrepreneurs at Arizona State University and specifically within this program the MSIVD program the entire cohort are launching new products new services new ventures and in fact these two are I know are working on ventures that are in the residential kind of uh, food service space or, or, or uh, um, I don't know how we want to classify that, but mm -hmm. uh, they're learning, you know, not only some of these uh, methods that you refer to about engaging customers and, and working with um, folks that complement their skills, whether they're technical skills or, or business skills or, or design skills. Um, so I wonder if we can, I love that you shared um, this idea of uh, leveraging a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal to communicate you know where you're going and and what the ultimate outcomes uh, should be so kudos to Jim Collins the author of uh, that particular book mm -hmm. um, so could you talk a little bit more about your your leadership philosophy your leadership methodology especially as it re relates to 
in, you know, creating a new product and ultimately bringing it to market successfully as these two and many others are doing within our audience. Yeah, I mean, a lot of my management philosophy stems from good to great and, you know, um, built to last, which is a, a Jim Collins book. But, you know, having BHAGs are really important. Uh, so the framework for, you know, an overall business strategy uh, and how you move forward um, was really framed by a lot of principles in that book, which is kind of a aged old book now, but it stood the it's test of time, yeah. right? And uh, but you know we, you know he didn't talk about consumer centricity in there, um, but really you know that's a big piece of it. Is you're not solving a consumer problem, then your reason for being is going to continue to get minimized. Um, but I think you know high performance leadership teams are really really critical. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, developing uh, the right team and team chemistry to put around you is really important. You have to know your own strengths and weaknesses. I always say I'm just a simple Polish accountant from the east side of Cleveland, <laughs> but somehow I made my way, and I think it had a lot to do with putting the right people around me that complement my skills in particular uh, as a leader. Um, and then believing in people and saying, hey, listen, you know, we're all on this growth journey of learning, you know, how to do different things and working in a business world that is not, you know, it's an evolving discipline. There's no perfect science to it. So you have to grow your people along with you um, and challenge them to, to, to commit to that, you know. You're not going to be the same person, you know, uh, 10 years from now as you are now and, you know, realize that that you can make the most of it or you could just let it go, but you know, make the most. Someone said to me, you're gonna work at least eight hours a day, so you might as well optimize the whole thing. <laughs> sure, uh, seems to sound to me, so let's uh, go get my master's and do a lot of different things, and it's turned out really good. So I think high performance leadership team, uh, there's, there's a, an author by the name of Lencioni talks about how you build a team. He wrote the five dysfunctions of team. Those principles are rock solid in terms of just how you have you know, trust, um, you have conflict, uh, you know, and, and, and but you do it in a very organized way uh, and nothing's ever personal. I think that that's really big. I'm really big on um, building a strategy and empowering people on how to um, be um, very tied into knowing what their role in that strategy is. We're very large business, Stanley has 50,000 employees, mm -hmm. uh, MTD has like 6,000. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's really important that you have a vision and a strategy and that you involve people in that strategy development so that when you finalize it, everybody's bought in. Mm -hmm. They agree or disagree, but they had a voice and then they know the role in that strategy. Well, the brand team knows they gotta deliver the branding message on this, the engineering team knows they gotta get this product to market to hit the, the targets that we, we needed to do, the sales team knows they gotta go get it placed, and they were all trying to place the same thing. That alignment is so impactful. It's, I, I've been uh, so convicted about that. I have these crazy cascade spreadsheets, you know because I'm an accountant, right? What they say. <laughs> so it's like, you know, here's our overall goals and here's how it goes into each function. And my admin assistant would ask me, really, how do I do this? Well, you help me with this, you help me with that, you help me with that, you make a big impact on this, as much as the engineer designing the Ultima does. And <laughs> so having that kind of uh, alignment throughout the organization so that everybody's focused on the same thing, um, you know, is, is really uh, mission critical. So, so getting the right people on the bus, as Jim Collins says, mm -hmm. the bus has to have a bus driver. And I think we have some photos of you uh, <laughs> driving the proverbial bus. Uh, let's take a look at these. Uh, what, what, what are we looking at here? Well, I talked about strategy development, and so we would have a strategy session. And, you know, I'd be wanting to do a boring strategy <laughs> team, but my marketing folks, they had a different idea, right? So we're like... Well, let's let's create let's create a theme for the, the the strategy sessions. We used to do them in Nashville, and you know, so one year the theme was let's get to the next level because we were in a profit improvement kick, <laughs> and so we used the the Jumanji theme. And my team there, you know, was very gracious to letting uh, letting the, the marketing team, you know, put them in Jumanji <laughs> uniforms, and and I was just the I was the leader of the you know I was the leader of the. Um, the, the the exploration, you know, trying to find that. It's a great analogy. That uh, that emerald jewel, and then uh, the next year, 
you know, you get, sometimes you have to be a superhero, right? So I was Captain America because I was president <laughs> of the Americas, and my team were all the other superheroes, and it was the it was uh, I think it was called the End Game, and that was the final year before we we knew we were going to get sold, and we knew okay. This is the final push to that end game, you know. Uh, it's a little bittersweet there, but, you know, I, I don't come up with these things. They do, you know. And then I, I, was, I always like to celebrate our successes. So we have a dealer convention. Every year, 1,500 uh, dealers come to Nashville or Cleveland or something. And so I was very famous for throwing T-shirts out to, you know, have some fun. You know, it's like, I guess it's from my Cleveland Cavs route, you know. <laughs> Uh, doing all that so but I'm getting a little older so they got me a t-shirt launcher gun nice. uh, you know so I didn't pull out my shoulder and uh, <laughs> you know so that's me uh, you know celebrating our success of the uh, the Ultima with our with our dealers uh, I think I only spilled a couple of drinks on people and didn't take out any lights and then the, the smart aleck uh, you know marketing team we give away turkeys every year for Thanksgiving so they, <laughs> they kind of put that frozen turkey in there but that's not real I wasn't launching <laughs> that's it was why I was just wondering. t-shirts you know it's like that thing start going around during turkey Labas is gonna be giving away turkeys it's like oh gosh you <laughs> so you gotta you gotta you know I was gonna say people say you have to have fun and I would say you know uh, I, don't, I don't know that I would say fun you have to learn how to enjoy what you mm -hmm. do because it's work you know no matter what you do it's work and uh, fun I think it's fun when you learn to enjoy it mm -hmm. but if the objective is just fun I don't know that always keeps everybody focused so so we learn how to enjoy ourselves while we're doing the work you know Love it. Thanks for sharing those photos with us. Kudos to your marketing team for <laughs> yeah. their Photoshop prowess. My team members are probably going to get upset when this shows uh, up somewhere. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll beg for permission. Or beg for... Uh, uh, forgiveness. Thank you. Yeah. Forgiveness. Yeah. So let's get off of that. Uh, so, Sruthi, do you want to um, uh, wrap us up from the, the student ambassador side of the equation? Yeah. Gary, we are very new entrepreneurs, like startup people. We don't have uh, the, well, we have the market opportunity. We don't have the internal resource to do that. Mm -hmm. What kind of advice would you give us uh, for new startups? Yeah, so um, ironically, I am not a startup entrepreneur, but mm -hmm. I've worked with two of the most successful entrepreneurs in the city of Cleveland. One was a hairdresser from the east side of Cleveland that turned his business into very large entity and sold it to Bristol Myers Squibb and ultimately it's with L'Oreal and and then the other one was a much more mature business 80 plus years in, in third generation leadership but they're all entrepreneurial in nature and and you know what I would say to um, young entrepreneurs like yourself number one um, I talk about having a clear vision of what you're trying to accomplish and I think the theory of victory I put that in there specifically for folks like yourself you can have an, I, I used to say to folks, an idea is not an initiative. An initiative is not a business. It's like you have to spend time while you're journeying through this, you know, creating a compelling vision of what this business is going to look like. Because whether it's a um, social business, you know, for social benefit or just pure for profit, it still has to have positive cash flow, right? So, and in order to get off the ground, you're probably going to need to convince someone to give you cash. And the more compelling that theory of victory is, the more likely it is that you will get support from, you know, capital markets or, or you know, friends and family or how, whatever round you're, you're on mm -hmm. uh, to make that happen. And that's not easy, right? That's not easy. That's why we spend a lot of time sitting in a room with a bunch of people trying to make sure that strategy sound in a very mature business. So in, in your space, you know, uh, it's, it's going to have to be a balance. But ultimately, that theory of victory and that business case for how you win, I think, from my perspective, is probably, you know, what I would offer as advice to you. Just by spending a few time with you, I could say that how fun it is to enjoy the process with you just by talking business. So <laughs> I hope I, I am to be in future. Yeah, so great. Yeah. great. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, and thanks for that question, Sruthi, because uh, in my work in helping to uh, 
coach up these these future entrepreneurs and and uh, industry leaders, right? Managing, being an entrepreneur, managing the innovation process inside an, an existing organization. We see a lot of our students go in that direction or or um, fluctuate between an entrepreneurial role and an entrepreneurial role. But in my methodology, I have uh, seven C's of kind of entrepreneurial mindset or innovation management, almost steps. And the very first C is care. And I think it, it maps on with your advice just now of you've got to be able to articulate that. This is, this is my uh, reason for wanting to you know, make the world a better place, whether mm -hmm. it be through um, residential food service or uh, hair care or, mm -hmm. or mowing lawns. <laughs> you know, you've got to be passionate about it in mm -hmm. order to get to those next levels of execution. So great examples. Mm -hmm. No, purpose is really important, and uh, I think more today than in the past. Uh, everybody wants to connect to you. Why am I doing this? You know, yeah. and the more you can get their heart connected to it, the more you know impact you'll have mm -hmm. over time. You know. So. If I may wrap up, um, because this is again such a key aspect of our entrepreneurial training at ASU is that integration and that deep contextual knowledge of the consumer market or the enterprise market if you're B2B, uh, would you be at liberty to kind of walk us through a little bit more tactically about how your team that you brought together to develop the, the, um, the mower that won you number one in innovation at Home Depot, um, how did they actually engage? You mentioned fo focus groups, but we also saw in the video kind of door-to-door -door almost uh, engagement. Are you at liberty to share any of those tactics that your team uh, uses inside and in, in a large organization like yours? No. <laughs> Damn, I knew you were going <laughs> to. <laughs> well, the, the, the point then, maybe you can help reinforce the point that being integrated with the end consumer is absolutely key to, mm -hmm. as you said, mm -hmm. your success. Yep. You knew you had a winner. The only way you knew that was because you were getting that direct information right. back from right. the market. Yeah, and I, I, it, it just goes to that point of throughout the development process, you cannot, you cannot do the work up front, mm -hmm. dispatch your team to find the solution, and then assume it came out the way you intended mm -hmm. at the beginning. Or the way that can, cause the consumer has limited amount of tools to express what they want. And, you know, focus groups are great. Uh, but they speak from one perspective, which is theirs. Is, it, is that one perspective or that group of 10 or 20 scalable to a marketplace? You know, that's, that's what the process we developed really, you know, figured out. Mm -hmm. So, but we can't, I can't go into that. I understand. <laughs> no, but, so we're learning, we're learning our own. We teach the methodology of customer development. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it really is leveraging the power of qualitative kind of, conversational, mm -hmm. interview-based uh, insight um, mm -hmm. gathering. Mm -hmm. And so I, I can assume that your team did did that. How you did that, we'll, we'll leave that for yeah. the, uh, <laughs> the playbook. But uh, well, the video shows, you know, the overview, so study it close. <laughs> we'll, we'll read between the lines. <laughs> no. uh, but this has been fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Gary, for mm -hmm. your time, and I uh, really appreciate you sharing your your story with us and uh, congratulations on all the success with, yeah, with this you. with your various roles uh, with this company and throughout your career yeah thanks it's been a pleasure being here you know and uh, I love sharing this stuff because um, it, was, it's, it's, it was fun really at the it wasn't fun at the time but it, when you turn back <laughs> and look at it, it was actually kind of fun <laughs> so thanks for having me awesome thank all right you. give it up oh, for thank Gary you. thank you so much